address the problem before it becomes a problem. Don't wait until somebody's ready to throw a punch before you address the problem. Oh, I got to go. Hey. I've been working, told them, please don't hit my phone. Yeah. I'm in my zone, bro. Just leave me alone. Hey. Was on the road, but I swear I'm coming home. Hey. Now the drinks on me, I think we need a toast. Hey. See, I did it for me. Now my old friends calling, told them nothing's for free. Told me time is money, dog. I swear I paid on my fees. I was starving for this game. Now my fan, they can't eat. Hey everyone, welcome, welcome to the Cup of Nurses show with your hosts, Peter and Matt, two nurses on a mission to change this world one conversation at a time. If you find value in this show and want to join us on this mission, please share and review the show. It would mean absolutely everything to us. Cupofnurses.com for any of our show notes, merch releases, and any updates. For our lifestyle podcast, you can check out wearefrontlinewarriors.com. In this episode, we would like to introduce you to Phil LaDuc. Phil is currently employed as a writer and board member on over 10 medical research oversight boards. We talk about workplace violence and the importance of communication and emotional de-escalation. Hey, Phil, welcome to the show. Can you share us your background and your experience? Yeah, absolutely. My first grown-up job was working the line at GM. I... Uh transition from there after they encouraged me and 60,000 other people mm -hmm. to explore other career opportunities. I went back to school, got my degree in organizational development, worked in that field for about nine years. I got dragged kicking and screaming into employee safety when one of my friends said, hey, we've got this big initiative uh, on safety. I said, nope, I got, I got no, um, interest in safety. I'm in the change business and safety's in the keeping everything the same business. Mm -hmm. And he kept, he said, well, and at the time I was doing lean manufacturing and creative problem solving, some really cool stuff. And he said, look, what we need is for you to do what you've done with your organization, which was a tier one auto supply company and turn it into uh, and apply it to this big three automotive company. Mm -hmm. So I did that. And at one point my boss came to me and said, you need to blog. He didn't know what a blog was. <laughs> that was clear. <laughs> so I started blogging and I said, if I'm blogging, it's going to be under my name. I'm going to say what I want. And I developed kind of a caustic mm -hmm. in your face. This is what's wrong. And this is what we need to fix it. And then he said, okay, I want you to also write articles for publication. Again, I, I said, okay. And I wrote one, we put it on, on there. My first article was stolen <laughs> and it was called what's wrong with safety training and how to fix it. And because if you look at OSHA, and Cavosh, any, any of these regulatory, they'll say they need, they measure training in hours, not in content. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but some of the most important training I had took two minutes, <laughs> you know, don't ever do that because that's full of acid. And if it gets on your skin, it will burn you to death. Mm -hmm. That's good. You know, give me the why, give me the what, and give me the why. But that kind of more from a, I, I, I've written now I've lost count, but it's over 2000 works on all inhabited continents. I even wrote for a Kazakhstan magazine mm -hmm. that was an online magazine only. After um, about 10 years of the company that I was with that forced me into something that I really wasn't that interested in, um, they encouraged me to explore other opportunities go figure they had when i started we had over a hundred employees mm -hmm. at that point we had nine and six of them were executives really on the job retirees they weren't doing anything mm -hmm. so we we're a little top heavy mm -hmm. so they let me go no they forced me to go i don't like to say they let me go because that sounds like i was held against my will mm -hmm. i was ready to move and i worked for trinity health systems one of the largest uh, health systems 
in the country. And my job there was to be a liaison between this ruthless cutthroat unified revenue organization and what the, the two groups that hate each other. They called my home group, the talent development group, the hippie commune. <laughs> so I had to walk between the cutthroats from the Price Waterhouse and the Deloitte's and the, the people. But the reality was this, it was, it was a very cool place to work. They were formed when two convents looked and they noticed that the youngest of their membership was 78 years old. <laughs> Wow, wow. And they owned all, they ran all these hospitals. And so they merged and they formed Trinity Health. Mm -hmm. And what they were most concerned about wasn't would the hospitals go on because they knew that eventually some organization would buy up those hospitals and run them. What they were concerned about is that their 550 year old culture was going to become extinct. Mm -hmm. When you're doing something like that, it really, you, re, you really buy in. Actually, they had like a 63%. Don't quote me on that, people. But it was very high turnover rate mm -hmm. the first year because they had these six guiding principles. And like, you're fully present. People aren't doing this mm -hmm. during meetings or people or someone will say, hey, we're fully present. You need to turn that off. And we communicate openly and honestly. If you were went and said, hey, I have a problem with so-and-so, your boss would say, what did so-and-so say when you approached her about this? I say her because it was 90% women. Mm -hmm. And it was a great place to work. My one criticism, everything was by consensus. I'm not a consensus guy. It's like, this is the answer. I'm, I'm responsible. This is what we're going to do. You may not like it, but live with it. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that, that struck me with Trinity is uh, they had another, another guiding behavior was expect goodness of intention. Mm -hmm. And it really was my introdu introduction to workplace violence and the problem of violence in healthcare particularly, because they brought in one of the creators of Just Culture, which I don't know if you're familiar with, but it's a completely different way of governing. And it's in high impact, high um, stakes places like healthcare, like aviation. Those are the two that's biggest where it's, if you get it wrong, someone dies. And often you made a mistake and the founders of the, the developed this theory said, it's not just to punish someone for someone, something that they didn't intend to do. And it had a horrible outcome that they feel guilty about. And I talked to, talked to nurses who left the profession simply because they screwed up in a minor way. And when I say that, anybody who's not in healthcare will say that's not a minor way. But for instance, they had a case, not in Trinity Health, but where the adult medication and the infant medication were stored together mm -hmm. in bottles that were virtually identi uh, identical. A nurse grabbed the wrong bottle, administered the shot to an infant and killed it. Was it her fault? No, I, I think anybody would, could have made that mistake. And so what Just Culture do, looks at is your decision-making process, not the outcome. And in that case, they found they, when you make an honest mistake and it has a negative out, um, outcome, the idea is to console the person who made the mistake. Then you have recklessness, mm -hmm. excuse me. Then you have risk-taking. Mm -hmm. Risk-taking is always appropriate. Getting out of bed's risk. 
You, you have to take risks. But what they want you to do is make informed choices about patient and safety. In one case, um, they had a gang member shot in Chicago. He's bleeding out. The doctor and the head of the ER would not let him in the ambulance entrance. They forced, they wanted to force him to go around to the emergency room entrance and get in. Boy, well, bled out there on the on the steps, waiting to get in. And I take that back. I don't think he was the gang member. I think he was just caught in the crossfire. Mm-hmm. We got bled out because the rules were so much more. And they said, you got to take some risks. Sometimes you have to break the rules because the situation makes sense. About Rules cover about 80% of what the situations we're going to handle. I'm sure you've seen that yourselves. Mm-hmm. It's It doesn't make any any sense to blindly follow the rules when someone's going to die. You can imagine if airline pilots said, if there's a rule that says you never, ever, ever do this, and they're nose diving into the ground, they say, screw this. I'm going to, well, take a look at uh, uh, Captain Sullivan who landed on the East River. I'm pretty sure that was against the policies. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't land on the East River, but he did what he had to do to keep people alive. So that got me interested in, well, how I came about to workplace violence was I I wrote, my first book was, I know my shoes are untied, mind your own business. I wanted to call it mind your own damn business, but if you do, Amazon and Barnes and Noble won't carry it. Mm -hmm. But um, so I, and it's one of those, it's based on a true story of, me in a plant and my shoes were always untied. And I had a guy and I won't use the name. I still remember it. Every day he would say to me, next time I see you with your shoes untied, I'm going to, I'm going to put you out of the plant. So I went out and I got safety shoes that were loafers and never seen him so angry, but on my way out to where I had to work. There was a guy, a super nice guy, I'd stop and talk to him and say hello. He ran an induction hardener. It looks like um, a um, a circle, almost, you know what an ankh is? No. The Egyptian no. sign of life. It looks like a cross, but at the top of it, oh, it's got oh, a yeah, circle. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It looked just like that. And it was the another part of it would shoot this shaft of metal and this thing through an electromagnetic force and it would harden the metal. You couldn't wear jewelry. You couldn't wear a watch, anything around there. He refused to take his wedding ring off. One day I asked where he was and he was dead Mm -hmm. because this thing, like a bolt of lightning shot from the, let's call it the Ankh. It built up, it had an electromagnetic force field basically. And it shot arced more than 12 feet connected to his wedding ring and electrocuted him to death. Wow. You can't look at something like that and not be affected. And so I always kind of looked at that, but what's going on? So I, my first book was about that. I know my, my shoes are untied. Don't you think there are bigger threats? Now I've walked around with my shoes untied quite a bit. I've stumbled. Oh, I would say lifetime, probably 30 times just tripping on your shoelace. I've worn work boots upstairs and almost fallen and have fallen because they don't teach you how to work in work boots or stepped on wet floors and have my feet go out. But I've never tripped on my shoelaces. So it's a book about all the ridiculous things that people tell you in safety. That is a, you absolutely must do that. Mm -hmm. But I thought back thinking back to my just culture days, it's like sometimes you gotta balance the risks. Mm -hmm. And so I started my second book, which um, is blood on my, I always get this wrong. Um, Blood in my pockets is blood on your hands. About the practice of giving incentives for people not to get hurt. Mm -hmm. And what happens is this phenomenon is someone will cut themselves and need stitches. So they'll take a dirty rag, wrap it around the wound and stick it in their pocket because they don't want to screw up the safety bingo or they want to screw up the the bonus 
that they're getting for not getting hurt. And that led me, then, so I was writing my third book, my uh, publisher said, hey, what do you know about workplace violence? Well, as it turned out, I had quite a background in workplace violence. Um, we had two, when I was working as head of uh, OD, organizational development, we had two cases of workplace violence. One, a man shot his estranged wife in the parking lot. The other, a estranged boyfriend followed his ex to a bar and she was with some coworkers and he gunned them both down within a week. Our head of our HR department is a great guy, but he made a mistake, a really bad mistake. He said in front of our CEO, this is terrible, but they don't count because it didn't happen on our property. The CEO blew up and he said, they, it counted, they were our people. They're dead. It counts. And he looked at me, he said, I want you to be an expert in violence prevention so that we don't ever have this happen again. So I dug deep. At that time, there wasn't much available on that. But my thinking is spot the red flags. But since then, I have been a friend of mine at one of um, the factories was shot dead defending um, a woman her, whose husband walked in, ex-husband walked in, shot her and her new boyfriend. And when the guy tried to save her, was killed. And uh, I was at the first, two of the first post office shootings. If you can believe this, this is how weird my life is. The first one was the Royal Oak, Michigan post office shooting. I was going to lunch with my boss and I said, I need to mail a letter. Can we swing by the post office? And he said, sure. So we went by the post office and he said, and I said oh crap, I gotta go in, I gotta get some stamps. And he said, hold on, I think I might have one. He looks in his wallet, he goes, you're in luck. This is your luckiest day. I've got a stamp. So he gives me a stamp, we, I mail it in the mailbox outside and we start to hear sirens in the background. And he said, oh, those are coming our way. Let's get out of here before traffic is impossible. Had I not had that stamp, I would have been walking in an active shooter. Mm -hmm. Then they had one uh, years later at the um, Oakwood Dearborn Post Office. I drove, I was looking for a payphone because I didn't, at that point, I'm aging myself, but I didn't have a, um, a cell phone and I needed a, a payphone and I pulled in a, a police officer stopped me and he said, you can't go in there. I said, I just need to use pay phone. He said, people are being killed in there. You need to get out of here. So I don't, I don't, you say, don't tell me that something, something like that. I don't need to hear it twice. So I left, but again, these events shaped who I, I was. So then when she, so I told her, you know, all these things and I, I made, wrote the book early and then I started writing on the opioid epidemic after finishing the book I'd already working on, calling uh, it Loving an Addict. My ex-wife, after um, our divorce, became a heroin enthusiast, um, a story that's plaguing um, our country, and people are still really not getting how deep this problem goes. Mm -hmm. And ultimately she remarried and broke that family up and eventually degraded to the point where when a news report would come on that they had an unidentified body of a white woman in Detroit, my heart would, I mean, my, my stomach would be a pit. Now this is 30 years after we were divorced. Um, and then one day, my daughter called me up and said, my mom's dead. And I had to go claim the body because the two girls just couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. You don't forget that kind of experience. Either. So I was going to write a book about how the collateral damage, not the, the opioid epidemic, and here's what you should do. And here's what we need to do to fix it. 
because that's not, I don't have the standing for that. Mm -hmm. I'm not an expert in substance abuse, um, but I am an expert in what it does to the people left behind. So they're writing that. And of course my publisher said, I need you to write a book about mass shootings. So that's coming out within a month. It took me two and a half years to write because it's, it's just so draining and grim mm -hmm. to talk about those things. And I learned a couple of things that were startling to me. One is mass shooters almost always have an initial first target in mind. They've got a grudge against someone. These are not, for the most part, these are not random. They're trying to kill someone. No one really understands why it goes from killing one or two people to killing 25. People have theories, but most of them don't bear up to scrutiny and research. But as part of that, I looked into and researched heavily healthcare. I came very nicely back to that, um, the behaviors I learned at Trinity Health. And so that's my very lengthy um, background, but that's what brought me here today. So thank you for that introduction, everything you explained. You have just like a, a wide variety of experience, but let's focus on safety and the workplace. So what are some common issues that you've experienced when it comes to violence or safety in general in hospitals or in the healthcare facilities? One thing that I found um, is that healthcare has a whole array of different problems than say a factory or a post office. And I was astonished to learn that the most common workplace violence incident is nurse on nurse. Mm -hmm. That shocked me because that was outside of anything I'd experienced. But yes, fist fights, uh, threats, it makes sense. You're, um, the violent, the, the targets for a workplace shooting tend to be soft targets. Now I worked, um, also I didn't mention, but I worked for another hospital system after leaving or both prior to, prior to joining Trinity as a safety consultant. Mm -hmm. And I would walk in, not sign anything, walk in, I would piggyback through doors just to see if anyone would challenge me and say, excuse me, can I help you with something? And it happened to me, I was there weekly, several times a week for eight months. I was challenged maybe four times. So it's pretty easy for an outsider to get into that. That's, that's what I call a soft target. There's not a lot of people there. You may have armed security guards, but I found the response of security has been not exactly conducive to saving lives. What do you do if a baby, you have a code pink? Mm -hmm. What's the first thing you do? Uh, lock, lock hospital down. Lock down, lock it down, right? You don't let anybody leave. Yeah. They do the same thing in mass shooting things. I, you know what? I want that guy out of there. Mm -hmm. I'll share a, a personal story. My father was a heart patient. My father was a um, a very old school. You don't lay hands on a woman. You don't. Um, you know. You don't fight. Fighting is for people who can't solve their problems with reason. They gave him morphine. He had a negative reaction to it and thought they were there to harvest his organs. Mm -hmm. A ridiculous thought that somebody who's 73, that those are the organs they're going to want to harvest. And so when they came in, he had hidden behind a door and they came in and he punched the nurse, cold cocked her, punched the um, orderly and they had to to restrain him and my sisters came in 
and he was physically restrained and he was still under the influence of the morphine and he said you guys are a bunch of crooks i know you're part of this you're just selling my organs etc mm. out of his head that was unforeseeable what wasn't unforeseeable is it happened again mm. later after my sisters had told the people at the hospital when he had more for the only time he's had morphine in his life he becomes violent and delusional they kind of patted her on the head said thank you for that two days later it happened again so i would say that's another um factor in workplace violence is the patients themselves I was shocked and I, I really can't explain except that you have a tense environment, you work long hours, you have fatigue, why it's nurse on nurse. Mm -hmm. You have an argument over something and pretty soon it turns into fighting. Mm -hmm. But here's where it gets complicated. Healthcare violence is measured differently than other violence. Healthcare violence could be you yelling at a coworker. Well, what I'm dealing with is not yelling. I would say the lowest form of workplace violence that I am talking about is punching someone, physically assaulting them. But they count verbal assaults, they count name calling, anything that you can consider bullying. Well, they Healthcare as an industry does itself a great injustice by lumping that all together. Wouldn't you want to know the number of people who have come in and shot someone versus someone who punched a coworker? I know I would. Or that they talk mean to a coworker. Boy, if that I mean if that were the case, I would be victim uh, of uh, I would be accused of of uh, workplace violence quite often because um, I'm, I'm known for if somebody comes in and doesn't have the authority to tell me what to do, mm -hmm. telling them what they can do. Um, but what is it, Trinity? We had a rule, a fireable offense mm -hmm. was even joking about violence. We couldn't, this one still drives me crazy frustrates me you know we couldn't use the term bullet point mm -hmm. we had to call them dot points mm -hmm. well bullets come from the roman bulletin which was an announcement and each subset of that was a bullet mm -hmm. it was much later that the that the gun was invented and they started using that because the original bullets were little round metal balls that look like that so and then one day hr said you, we all need you to come to, to hr make an appointment to hr to come and get your new headshots <laughs> i said we can't say bullet point but we can say headshots <laughs> so the absurdity so back to the original point though so you have a soft target you have a lot of people in bed. Then you have this emotionally charged, you know, somebody, I mean, nurses have a thousand things to do. And the fact that your mother wants a glass of water is taking too long is probably 958 on the list. And, but, but you really can't, I mean, I'm, you can't explain to people that this is your number one priority. You're worried about your mother. You, you're worried about the, the, the patient and nobody cares. Well, they care, but, and what you have, and I tell people safety is always most important, but it's not always most urgent. Mm -hmm. You know, if some there's water on the floor and, and they say, well, somebody could slip. True fact, right? They could. But you got to extrapolate from that. Okay, they slip. 
the chance of them interacting with that is small. If they do, the chance of them slipping is smaller. Mm -hmm. If they slip, do they fall is even smaller. And if they um, fall, do they harm themselves or someone else? Tiny versus someone who's coding and you need to be there right now mm -hmm. because it's not, because that's most urgent and that you might, it, it's not a safety issue. It's a life and death issue. Recently, my wife had a detached retina. Um, I won't get into the particulars of it, but it happened uh, during an eye exam at her work. And when I went, I took her, she started exhibiting symptoms on a Friday. She went to my family doc, our family doctor, and I'm used to my doctor because she just, she just switched to my doctor. And he said, well, you need to go in to see an op ophthalmologist. He said, well, I just did. And he said, yeah, and now you have symptoms. So you got to go back. So she figured she'd go Monday. By Sunday, she was completely blind mm -hmm. in one eye. And my experience was we went to several hospitals. She had to have surgeries. The doctors and nurses and the other personnel weren't particularly nice to, to people. So you've already got this heightened, charged, emotional environment that is just another day at the office for staff and, and medicine. And a lot of them I've seen far, far worse. That's the term I like to use, another day at the office and I show up to a shift. <laughs> you know, it, but it's, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, it's like you, you go into an emergency room and you see these people sitting around. It's like, that's not an emergency. Yeah. And with my wife, it certainly it was foremost on our minds, but it wasn't, it was just another day at the office for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. As it turned out, we were very, very happy with the, the quality of the care. I was a little put off by the fact that they kept asking her um, if she felt safe at home and looking at my knuckles to see if I belted <laughs> her around. But after the fact, it's like, you know what, it's kind of nice that they're that they're looking into that. Yeah, yeah. But so you have all these factors. I can walk in. I walk into an emergency room with a gun and put a pill in the head of the the woman who's the, you know, telling me, well, you need to fill this out. I need your insurance card. Those kind of things. Um, there was a recent shooting, uh, not recent, maybe a year ago, where somebody walked in and shot a, a, a several, a doctor and several people because he was unhappy, not with his the care from the doctor. He was happy because of his bill. It was supposed to be, in his mind, it was supposed to be paid by insurance, but it wasn't. And so he picked up a gun and went in there. But that's very different from from this. In fact, I'm surprised that there is not more workplace violence in healthcare because they're really not doing a lot to prepare for it. Mm -hmm. And what I found is some of the advice that people give you when you're in an active, I call them rampage attacks instead of mass shootings, because a rampage attack is just somebody who is going in with a weapon. They've had machetes, they've had um, pistols, they've had automatic rifles, but the common denominator is they've, they've come, they've become unhinged. And I could certainly see why, how that would happen in healthcare with the open access. In most cases, they're not supposed to be open access. They're key cards, but I won't put you on the spot and say, how many times have you used a key card and let somebody in behind you? Yeah, yeah. Um, sure, sure. I've, I'm a safety professional and someone, even if it's someone, you know, 
you just can't do that. So mm -hmm. the, the guy, I've had to turn people say, they say, look, I'm not trying to be a jerk, but you got to go to the security and get a temporary badge. Yeah, oh, come on, man. I, I, I said, look, that's, if you're left in your car, go get it out of your car. If you're left at your desk, it won't hurt you to have the temporary badge, use it, bring it back. Because many times in mass shootings, they haven't alerted people that the person has been fired is no longer allowed on the premises. Mm -hmm. So you, know, you could see somebody every day for six years, not know that he or she's been fired and they come in and say, Oh, you know, Hey, hold that door. Many of us would do that without thinking. Mm -hmm. So that open access, you're not going through some hospitals now have metal detectors and cameras and armed security, but really the, the traditional model of what to do in a, rampage attack is incredibly foolish. And that is run. Have you heard this? Run, hide, fight back as a last resort. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, human beings are predators. Our eyes are in the front of our head versus prey, which have them typically on the sides. Our eyes are, are specifically adapted to see movement. So if you're running, there's a fair chance that you're now going to be a target. The average rampaging attacker wants to kill someone and they want, they will kill anybody who gets in their way between them and someone. They don't care if somebody has a gun or says, stop, you can't go back there. That's one of the worst things you can do is engage with them. Just, what I, what I advise people, pull the fire alarm. You pull the fire alarm, you have police, ambulances, you have everybody converging on the scene. It confuses the rampaging attacker. And like as not, they're going to run out of there. But we need to do a better job of protecting, as it turns out, protecting nurses from each other. And even the, the structure of healthcare many cases the doctors don't work for the hospital they work in the hospital um that creates some problems because they they in many cases feel they don't have to follow the rules so that's just another pressure that you have with nurses and i'm focusing on nurses not because the of the name of your um of your show as much as they tend to be on the front line of workplace violence. So Phil, when it comes to the workplace violence and what interventions do you see in the perfect environment to implement to prevent things from happening or decreasing the workplace violence? Well, first of all, I think that people should be taught de-escalation mm -hmm. techniques. And let me start by saying no one in the history of language has ever calmed down because someone says, you need to calm down. You need, you need to chill <laughs> you know and so that one it's, it's like i've said i've had customer service people you need to calm down so wow i hadn't thought about that you're right i need to calm down wow that's <laughs> it, it, it this is magic de-escalation um techniques work more like this hi i'm phil you seem really angry can you help me understand what's going on? Mm -hmm. Not what's going on. By asking for help, it's very difficult to put yourself in that place. When someone asks you, can you help me to do this? Then it's real hard as human beings to say, no, I can't help you. That's not my job. Mm -hmm. Then name the emotion. You seem angry. You seem frustrated because and I equate this to having dinner and you say, Hey, could you pass me the salt? I don't use salt, I use pepper, but so if you ask me and I do nothing, I don't react at all. What do you do? Pass again. 
ask again and ask again louder. Mm -hmm. If I still don't react, what do you do? Take the salt. You raise, you keep raising it up until you get a reaction. And what people need first and foremost is, and I used to teach these de-escalation techniques. And it's like, if I walk in, and I scream, it's raining outside. I'm not giving you a weather report. Mm -hmm. So it would look something like this. And say, I say that and say, wow, Phil, you really seem angry about, about the uh, rain. Damn right I'm angry about it. Like, wow, you're really upset about this. What's going on? Well, I've got this meeting. Um, I had all my notes arranged. I had in a folder. I dropped them in a puddle. Now they're ruined, blah, blah, blah. Now you, now they can move away from yelling at you about what's going on. And they can talk about what's really bothering them. Mm -hmm. Now let's take this and put this into a healthcare situation. Somebody walks up to the nurse's station and screams, what, is nobody working around here? Does nobody have a job? How do you respond to that? You say, wow, sir, you're very angry. Did you need help? Can you help me understand what's going on? Well, my mother's been pressing her call button for this or that. Never defend that. So, well, that's, that's inexcusable. What does she need? And how can we help you right now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because what's happened here is what used to be a number 958 on your list of priorities just went to number one mm -hmm. because this person's gone to the boiling point and could very well result in violence. You do not want them to leave the area either because when they leave and we're talking about a very small group of people but they may come back with a weapon mm -hmm. and attack you next the old adage of is you know run hide fight back no de-escalate if you can now we're not talking at this point i'm not talking about somebody coming through actively engaged in violence. In that case, as uh, one of the sources in my book, uh, Jonathan Gold, um, who works for Gifford uh, for responsible gun ownership, basically, it's it's Giffords for um, gun owners. You may remember uh, Congress um, woman Gifford who got shot in Arizona. Mm -hmm. um, she has an organization that that advocates for responsible gun ownership things like you should be able to limit where people take who can have the guns and where they can take them so you, you don't want to um run you don't want to hide um you want to be an advocate for them if you can solve but i mean when we're again when they are unarmed. Mm -hmm. Also, I think, and then from that, try the best to solve your problem and say, you know, the next time you have an issue, I would like you to recognize two things. One, we do, we care very much about your mother and the care she gets. So if it's an emergency, please come and get us. Come out like you did and make a commitment to them to help. Mm -hmm. But secondly, we have people on this floor who are coding. That means they are dead and we are bring we have to get their heart beating again or we have people that are requiring they have to be rushed into surgery. So please be patient with us and help us to give the best care, not just to your mother, but to everyone's family members. Mm -hmm. But trying to assert dominance over this mm -hmm. creates a need in them 
to do this. And ultimately it can end very badly. Yeah. So that's my recommendations. Yeah. Now, if, if they do, if you do have workplace fines, you, they need to do a better job of, of educating people on the idea of access and turning your soft target environment into a hard target. Mm -hmm. So how do you do that? One, the enemy of a external intruder is time. Security's on their way. They only have so much time to start blasting or start injuring people. So slow them down as much as you can. Lock doors, move, you know, move into locked places until it's all clear. But I'm gonna circle back to what do you do if in a case where you have workplace violence between coworkers, completely different animal, but at Trinity, they were at the time they've been, they've merged and purchased hospitals. So I don't, I can't speak for them now, but when I was working there, they use the book, um, crucial conversations and that format. And I recommend that highly for any organization because, and to enforce it, say, well, you need to have a cru crucial conversation with this person and there are steps. One of them is talking about, because usually you're angry mm -hmm. and you're not thinking, but speak in terms like, I want, I feel, I need, or actually, I need, I want, it doesn't matter the order, mm -hmm. by the book. <laughs> I can't, but anyway, the, the idea being that you sit and say, and when you say to someone, well, um, I, I don't like the fact that you ran to my boss and have done this numerous times about something that I did in my job that you didn't agree with. Mm -hmm. Well, you have to understand the person who worked in your job before you say, okay, I need you to stop. We can talk about that in a minute, but right now we're going to talk about this specific behavior and why it happened and what I want to come with it. Mm -hmm. So that one, by, by teaching yourself how to teaching, not just nurses, you get a lot of this also in um, accounts payable. You get a lot of, a lot of violence in accounts payable because people are unhappy with paying their bills. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always think, I always thought when I was working to, to unify, to get, we, you don't need 250 different account payable systems. And everyone was more than happy to, to um, have a common system as long as everyone else used their system. Mm -hmm. If it was, you had to change, they weren't having it. So a lot of the stuff that I was doing was working them through the pain of change, which is real. But I think the idea of assuming goodness of intention really helps mm -hmm. having values within the organization. But what can you do as a person is one, recognize that the other person's upset Two, recognize that you're upset. It, it and really recognizing that violence isn't the answer. But I would say this, no one starts off and says, yep, I'm going to punch that guy. <laughs> they, it builds, it builds and builds and builds. And my father used to say he was very anti litigious. He said lawsuits are for people who don't feel they're being listened to. And that's where this violence comes from. A lot of people feel like they're, you can imagine you just, you, you had to, you have uh, your child has been in the hospital or seriously injured. Not something 
a chronic condition that got um, worse and worse until ultimately they um, they died. But something where a trauma comes out of the blue on a Tuesday afternoon and and your kid is dead and now you have to pay the bill. Mm. You're probably going to be in a heightened emotional state. Right. Probably not going to. It's like, you didn't save my kid. You killed my kid. My kid died because you guys couldn't fix it. Right. Well, of course that's not fair. But you gotta you gotta put yourself in that person's position. Say that's it's a terrible thing. Um, acknowledge their emotions. Acknowledge their emotions and talk about. Don't say I know how you feel, unless you've had your child die at a hospital after a trauma. Say, hey, so, you know this is. This, this is, I can't even imagine what's going on. This is a horrendous time for you. Can you help me understand how you're feeling? And they'll tell you, and they might say, I feel like crap. We're using some things stronger than dropping F-bombs. And too often, and it happens in customer service, it happens in healthcare, it happens in in the airlines, too, happen, too often, Someone will not acknowledge the feelings, acknowledge that what is going on is wrong. Mm -hmm. The customer is not always right, but the customer is always the customer. Without them, we don't have jobs. But also, when we have an emotional response, it's right above our medulla oblongata the alligator brain uh, brain as some um some people refer to it we can't control our emotions that's just that's chemicals flooding into our brain but we can control our behavior mm -hmm. and when you send out positive helpful stimuli the response in the chemicals flowing through our brain tends to slowly replace these negative emotions with, okay, this person's on my side. But you can't shortcut the process. And if you do shortcut the process, they no longer see you as a friend. They see you as an enemy. Mm -hmm. And when you get to the point of violence, you tend to be making binary decisions. And this is interesting. Somebody, I was blogging and, and, and somebody was um, asserting things that were just absolutely ludicrous. And, and I said, where's your evidence? Where, you know, give me a source. I would love to check this out. I don't need any sort of, and somebody wrote to me privately and said, well, Phil, you don't cite your sources. Mm -hmm. Man, that made me mad because they were right. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I realized I hadn't any psychology classes since I was in college, and that's been some time ago. And they've done a lot in brain research now that they can do MRIs on the brain. And what I so I went out and I bought 15 textbooks on the human brain and sat down and read them. Everything, not all textbooks on the human brain, but everything, but why we make mistakes, the synoptic self from the philosophical, are we the, as a person, are we the net sum total of our thoughts and emotions, or are we something else to the very scientific? And what I found was of all the psychology that I learned, most of it was hokum. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they asked people how they felt and how they made a decision. The one who got it most right, and this blew my mind, was Freud. Mm -hmm. They found when people make decisions, they are not using the logical cognitive part of their brain. They're using the emotional one. 
And then, so you make an emotional decision. And if you think, not me, I'm like Mr. Spock on Star Trek. I am complete logic. I do. Well, you're kidding yourself. Because what's happening is you get this idea that you created throughout your emotions. And then you went out and looked for logical things. And Mm -hmm. Google, and I'll call Google out on this, Google's algorithm leads you towards things that you already believe. Yeah. Yeah. So you can find evidence of you know, studies that say, no, no, it's all logic. But the accepted scientific theory is we make our decisions emotionally. So back to your point, identifying the emotions says to, says to the person, I understand what you're feeling. Mm-hmm. And it gives them a chance to correct you again if they start yelling if yelling even more so i'm sorry i must have misunderstood what's going on help me to understand i, I see i violate my own rule but help me to understand what's going on oh don't I, it's, it's nothing i just uh, no i i really want i really want to talk to you what are you feeling right now and let's talk about that And then we can get into what needs to happen to take care of your loved one or to take care of your bill or to take care of whatever issue you have. Because remember, that's where they're making their decisions. So when you get them using that emotional part, when they're vocalizing their emotions, you're putting them in a better place to make Mm -hmm. a reasonable decision because they've made that shift from yelling to reflecting. And when they reflect and they express that emotion and you, you listen, you, you can't fake this. You listen, your body language should do that and, and empathize as much as you can. You may not feel, now there's a lot of people don't realize there's a big difference between empathy and sympathy. Sympathy is, I know how you feel and I feel bad for you. Mm -hmm. Empathy is, I can relate to how you're feeling. I can attach your emotion to some life event I had that made me feel in a similar way. But you never want to tell anybody, I know how you feel. Because that's just going to make people angry. But you can say, Help me to help me to understand how you're feeling right now. It's awkward as heck doing that at first. You found like um, one of the things that, that I also learned at Trinity was that they would say, can I give you some feedback? Which is, I always said, that's like a woman coming up to me and saying, we need to talk. It's never, t- they've never tell it, telling me great things about, so are you getting taller? You lose weight? Man, you're looking good today. I gotta tell you, you're one, one good looking man. You're really a catch, I'm glad you're in my life. <laughs> it's, you know, you know what I've always hated about you? And so you stiff but you ask permission. Can I give you some feedback? And this felt so unbelievable, awkward, so outside my style, I couldn't believe it. But they would say, our formula was, and I still use this, I value this, this, and this in you. And I feel you could be even more effective if you did X. Mm -hmm. Then you say, thank you, and you move on and offer your help. You say, thank you. How can I help you to be more effective? Mm -hmm. It's a big difference. And well, the other day you were late and I've noticed a pattern where you're late a lot and I don't like it. And if you don't stop, I'm going to write you up. Mm -hmm. Address the problem before it becomes a problem. Mm -hmm. Don't wait until somebody's ready to throw a punch before you address the problem. Yeah. So Phil, listening to your points, it seems like the best way to approach a conflict or resolve a conflict is through good communication and emotional awareness. 
we touched a lot about how to help like a distressed person get out of their emotional state but how can somebody get themselves out of that emotional state that way they can think more logically because a lot of times I mean not a lot of times but all times we work in a field full of full of women and they get emotional a lot and that gets that gets that kind of surpasses their logical thinking sometimes because they get so caught up in their emotions so how, so if I'm in like an emotional state and I want to approach a conflict how do I get myself out of those emotions it's tough I, I will acknowledge that um, I had a situation as I mentioned where um, I worked with mostly women and I had one who thought she should have gotten the job that I got. Um, it was very difficult for me, but it comes back to number one, assume goodness of intentions. And that works like this. Can I talk to you about something? Go to a neutral place, first of all. But before you begin, even approach, assume goodness of intentions, even if they've done it a hundred times. Then don't assume goodness of intentions, but don't assume their emotional state. They did that because blah, blah, blah. And we can extrapolate, right? The only reason they did that was because they wanted this and they did that because it was on Tuesday and they know that the boss is out on Tuesday. So they, so pretty soon you've got this conspiracy, a great script for a conspiracy movie built up in your head. <laughs> Go in with a blank slate. It's okay to be angry. Go in and say, I want to talk to you about something that's really been bothering me. Share your feelings. Say, what happened? Remember, this is this is what I what I um, this is how I feel. This is what I want. This is what I need. And so, this is how I feel. I had a coworker backstab me and had to have one of these conversations. I was ready. To, um, I don't mind saying that. I was ready to take his head off. And I said, you know. I'm not going to do that same, you know, again, start using the help me to understand how this happened. How did we get here? So I said, you know, I thought we were friends and I felt betrayed. Just saying I'm angry at you really doesn't get into it, right? But when you say, you know, I'm trying very hard to meet you halfway and I don't feel like this is being reciprocated mm -hmm. but getting yourself into that frame of right mind begins with assuming that they didn't and you know what I found most of the time I'm right when I'm assuming goodness of intention you probably didn't realize this but I was assigned to that project and when you did this it made my life a lot harder and the project could be anything. And so I want to talk to you about that because I'm feeling betrayed. I'm feeling resentful and I just would like to talk about, it. so can you help me to understand how we got here and focus on the issue? They will try to deflect because nobody likes to be called out, especially if they didn't have such good intentions. They want to deflect. Well, you need to understand that, you're, well, you know, wait, you were taking too long. Or, so we can talk about that in a second. But right now, I want to focus on this. And then if they still can't, then you take your grievance and you set up a meeting with their boss and your boss and the two of you and you sit down in the same room and you try it again. And at that point, usually you'll have calmed down, they will have calmed down and you have other people that can, that are there to be intermediaries. Mm -hmm. And if more people did exactly what you said, take 
stock of their own emotions and their own behaviors. We can't control our emotions. We can control our behaviors, how we act on those emotions. But you don't need to pretend somebody stabbed you in the back or somebody screwed you over in some way. You don't need to pretend that it's okay. When you pretend it's okay, you tell them they actually learn that that behavior is okay. And it's not okay because you, you don't feel I've, I've worked in organizations where two people thought they had the same job. Now, fortunately I wasn't one of them, but can you imagine how difficult that situation is mm -hmm. where you think this responsibility is yours and they think it's theirs. They're, they're going to be, it's, it's the us versus them mentality. It's territoriality conflict. No, this is mine. You worry about your stuff. This is mine. Try not to use aggressive language when you're talking about that. So it said, did I ask you for, I was trying to help. Mm -hmm. Well, don't, doesn't help. That's not de-escalating. Mm -hmm. Or, well, it wasn't helpful. Or did I ask you for help? You want to avoid all those things and say, I appreciate that. And thank you for, for trying to help. Mm -hmm. But going forward, I want you to ask me if I need help before just jumping in. Jeez. <laughs> it's just like uh, Victor Frankl says between stimuli and response, there's space. And in between that space, you know, let your emotions get too much into you and you, you know, you control your behavior between that space. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's a wonderful quote. Um, and, the power of, well, I'll share a little anecdote that I'm so known for. Years ago, I used to be a road warrior on the road constantly. And if you travel a lot, you soon realize something always goes wrong. It's a mess. And there's so many details that are not just uh, important, they're crucial. You have to be through security at security at a certain time to get through at a certain time to be at your gate at a certain time to catch a flight at a certain time. And there's so much of it that's out of your control. And I was a grump. If something was wrong, if somebody wasn't doing their job, I'd tell them about it. So one day I'm sitting in an airport and an incoming flight comes in and the Detroit airport is pretty easy as long as you're going to connecting to a big city. But this gentleman had left himself 20 minutes and he was going to, I think the Flint airport or Lansing. Well, as it turns out, you have to go through an underground tunnel and it's probably two miles from, from when you get up and get everywhere. And the plane was 10 minutes late. And he had missed his flight. They'd already, I mean, they start boarding 20 minutes before that. So why anybody would give themselves that? So he launches into this hostile screaming. And I'm thinking to myself, is that me in five years? And I didn't like this view of myself in the future. And I'm thinking, this is a problem that's completely his making, but he's trying to sh throw that over the fence onto her. Nobody wants that man out of the airport more than her with the possible exception of me. And there was nothing she could do. Ultimately security came and they escorted him off. And it's like, did that end in the way that got you what you wanted? Mm -hmm. the answer of course was no. So I took, and, and it was very hard at first. I took to whenever I took some of the tasks or reported them to their manager or whatever, doing the opposite for somebody who did a good job three times. So three times for every time. I, so the first time I want to complain about something and I'd say, you know what, screw it. It's not a big enough deal for me to have to find someone and compliment her three times. 
And then it became part of my nature and that stimuli and response. I started to expect the gate agent to be respectful to me because I was being respectful to the gate agent. And it just giving out those positive stimuli was eliciting a, a positive response. And I realized, I don't know what these people are going through. I don't know if they just lost a loved one or they're going through a divorce or whatever, but ultimately it worked out to the point where I've had hotel upgrade me to the, the best suite in the hotel simply because I was understanding they're apologizing. Everyone's crabbing because everything's fine. And I just said, you know what? Take your time. I'll just drop my bag with a bell captain and, and uh, I'll come back later when it's not so crowded and check in if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Sure thing. Bam. The, I'm, I'm not a problem. Then I come, come back later, pick up my bag, I open the room. And it's like, holy crap, this is wonderful. Mm -hmm. Got updated on, a, on a, a flight one time. This makes me look like a better person than I actually am. Um, but I was sitting in right behind first class aisle seat so I can get off the plane because I'm always mystified by these people who, when the plane lands and the bell goes off that you can leave your seat, remain seated and look at each other like they have no idea that the flight is over. So I like to get my stuff and get out. I travel light, I move fast. So I'm, I've got the best possible seat short of first class. Guy gets on and crutches. They have no more available handicap seats. And I'm looking at him like, crap. And I said to the flight attendant, I really didn't want to. And they said, because his seat was in the last row in the middle seat. And I said, would it be possible for me to swap seats with him? She looked at me like I had two heads and said, why would you want to do that? And I said, he just needs it more. And she said, he's, he's in a real miserable seat. I said, yeah, it's the even more miserable on crutches. So there's a bathroom right there. So if he needs to get up and relieve himself, he can do that right there. And the flight attendant said, well, we're really not supposed to, to allow that, but let me check with my lead attendant. Well, she comes storming back. She said, you want to trade seats with him and take one of the best seats and trade for one of the worst. And you paid extra for the seat. And I said, yeah. She said, and you think that's fair? I said, I think it's the decent thing to do. And she says, no. And I'm like, I'm not ready to argue with her, but I was just shocked. She goes, that's not what we're going to do. She said, grab your things. And I said, I thought it was being thrown off the plane. It's like, this seems like, this seems like a, 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 a very quick excellent, um, escalation and also an extremely inappropriate response to me volunteering to do this. She takes me up to first class and she said, this is what you deserve. Mm -hmm. wow. She said, you gave up your seat for a stranger and we thought we were going to have to ask for a volunteer up front to, to swap and we knew we weren't going to get anybody. And then you saw the situation and reacted. It's all part of starting today. And anybody out there listening, I would like them to commit to start putting out positive stimuli and train yourself. It's a, it's a skill just like anything else that you have to practice and you have to stay at it. It took me forever to get there because I was really a jerk. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not proud of that, but travel brought out the worst in me. And um, I found that uh, um, this 
the whole thing made it so much better. I used to love, I would stay in Mooresville, North Carolina, and they had a Hampton that was race car, mm -hmm. uh, I think. And I would always, they would call up and ask how my room was. And I said, I specifically requested the race car shaped bed. <laughs> and, and they would just humor me and say, we'll bring that right up. <laughs> but they got a kick out, I've got a, I got a kick out of it. And, um, but it begins with, you know, controlling your emotion, be, your behavior, but recognize that you're not being your best self and you do not want to embarrass yourself later by having handled it so poorly. Mm -hmm. And believe me, people can push your buttons. And, uh, there's a great book by this, um, by burn. I don't remember his first name, but it's written in the mid sixties on transactional analysis and it's adult. We, we adopt three roles, adult, um, adult parent or child. And the person we're talking with or interacting with has adult parent or child. When you have adult adult, you have a conversation like we're having right now. Hopefully I'm not making you guys angry. And if I am, I'm glad that we are, um, half a continent away, so you can't punch me in the head. <laughs> um, but, you know, we can enjoy each other's company. We can talk. And uh, then there's parent. Parent talks. You will. You must. Mm -hmm. Very directive. And that tends to trigger the buttons. And the name of the book, I should say, is The Games People Play. Um, it's by the same author as I'm okay, you're okay, which became a pop culture phenomenon. But this really gives you good understanding. Said that the, the child in us never really leaves us. Mm -hmm. So we have those, you can push those buttons and you have a parent child dispute. You're gonna do this. No, mm -hmm. you can't make me. Parent, parent, you're gonna do that. Don't you talk to me like that, mister. You're gonna do that or child, child, where it's either overt aggression or passive aggression. The key to your, the situation you described is stay in the adult mode. Neutralize your um, body language, neutralize the stimuli you're sending out and focus on your behavior, not the situation. Mm -hmm. And it works takes a long time. I used to teach a class where I would have people abuse me deliberately <laughs> and I would stay in the adult and they would, they would try to, and they, and they would finally say, I can't do it. I can't do it anymore. Cause they would eventually come to that level. So then you have a level playing field and you can talk like grownups. Mm -hmm. So Phil, one last question. This is the way we like to wrap up the show. If you could have one more cup, cup of coffee with anybody that are alive, who would it be and why? That's interesting because I write for um, for um, Authority Magazine. Mm -hmm. And the question, we do have a wide variety of celebrities of all um, walks of life. Um, but uh, the, <laughs> there's, they read it as dead or alive. Mm -hmm. And so people will put in there, you know, I would like to have lunch with uh, with Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, he's been dead for 263 years, so you better bring a shovel. <laughs> and I'll see what I can do. But um, for me, I would I would love to have um, um, uh, Hunter Thompson. Mm -hmm. I would love to have have his take on on gun violence on on the uh, Trump years on just modern society but unfortunately he took his own life yeah. um and an interesting side note of that people compare a lot of my writing to hunter thompson's mm -hmm. and i didn't didn't even hadn't even read anything by him until before my first book had been mm -hmm. published and i don't see the i don't see the similarity at all he's a much better writer but he was told by a doctor when he was in his late twenties that he would be dead 
by the time he was 30. Mm -hmm. So from that point on, he lived his life like there was no tomorrow because for all he knew, he couldn't expect more than that. So I think it'd be interesting to get his take on, on um, the things that I'm passionate about, like um, gun violence, who even though he, he was a pro-gun ownership, he was also somebody who believed in responsibility, accountability. Yeah, I'm a pretty big fan of Hunter S. Thompson too. I have one of his books. I have yet to read it. It's on my list, but I'm definitely looking forward. So that's it's pretty. It's probably one of our, one of our uh, best responses, Hunter S. Thompson. Which uh, um, which book did you get? Um, I forgot the title. It's one of his more more popular works. Um, I, I have to look it up. I bought it like last year, and I've been kind of slacking on it. One of my one of my the most popular is mm -hmm. uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Vegas. Yeah. I think that's the one that I have. That's, yeah, that's that's my one of my least favorites. Is Hell's it, is Angels it? is one of my favorites. That was before uh, he embedded himself mm -hmm. with the Hell's Angels for two years and wrote about his experience. And it's it's a very very mm -hmm. good book. But enjoy it. Yeah, he's a very interesting individual for sure, to say the least. Yes. Yeah, yeah I read. I've written, read pretty much everything that uh, he has. He gave me the best piece of advice um, when writing. He would write, he, may, he would type, mm -hmm. just take a book and be and touch type um, Hemingway or Steinbeck because he considered them the top shelf best writers. Mm -hmm. And he said, you can learn a lot just by typing their words on the page we learned a lot about syntax and how to describe things. And uh, so <laughs> I've adopted that practice and it's improved my writing quite a bit too. Okay. okay, very interesting. I have yet to take on writing, but maybe I'll start. Maybe I'll get into it after I read uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Yeah, it's, it is a good book. Yeah, it's just cool. not as much as I've had so many people. And, you know, you have so many people that hype you up on something, mm -hmm. whether it be a movie, a book or whatever. And oh, this is the greatest thing in the world. And then you finally read it. It's like it can never live up to the expectation that, yeah. that, that people have said. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Phil. Really appreciate talking to you. We definitely gained a lot of knowledge. Maybe we'll have you on again for another topic. Anytime. I can talk about anything at any, any, any length and, um, and just make stuff up because people don't look up facts anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank, really, you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for uh, allowing me to share something I'm very passionate about. It's been great uh, meeting you guys. And uh, I look forward to uh, to hearing more about you yeah, and your yeah. success. And then, Phil, where can people find you or how could they get in contact with you if they want to reach out? Um, I have an author's page on, on um, Amazon. Mm -hmm. I have a blog. The best thing to do is Google Phil Law, L-A space capital D-U-K-E. That'll bring up tons. I used to write for Entrepreneur, and mm -hmm. I mean, my writing's all over the place, but um, that's your best bet. Okay. It's it's trying to encapsulate. I kept trying to get a um, like a storehouse where people would just go click to, to the articles. and I got about... 40 articles in and said, ah, screw this. <laughs> <laughs> they, can, they can Google it. For sure. For sure. Okay. I even sounds, put sounds some of my citations. And said, I, I forget where I read this. Google it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it's, always good, it's always a good search. Google search. Google search. Well, hopefully hopefully thank somebody thank found something useful here and, and they can take that with them. It's been a pleasure talking to you.